Uh, thanks for coming. If I haven't met you before, uh, I'm Mike Walker. I'm an MPhil student in the Department of Engineering, but I'm not talking about my research tonight. My research is much more boring than what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, because I'm talking about uh, international law as it relates to my job. I'm an officer in the US Navy. Uh, I'm a diver for the Navy and eventually working on becoming a submarine officer for the Navy. Uh, so I, I was telling Salvas, I, I pretty much watched like every Chew Talk posted online in preparation for this and everybody has like some scary statistics that they cite to like grab your attention. Uh, I don't have that, instead I have a hype video that I'm gonna show. <laughs> Yeah, so I showed that video because uh, it makes, uh, makes me want to join the Navy. I don't know about you. Uh, but, but also, it does a really good job of, of showing like the full spectrum of the battle space. So from you know, a submarine at like 1,000 feet and 50 atmospheres of pressure all the way to like a satellite in geosynchronous orbit. And so you know, we, we really need uh, some kind of framework, some kind of like set of laws to, to really govern like how we operate in that, in that battle space. Uh, so I guess kind of the overview of my talk is I'm going to talk about kind of split up law of the sea and then the law governing space. Uh, talk about the importance, kind of give an overview of what, what, each, what, what the law actually entails, and then uh, apply some current events uh, to, to, I guess, look at some current events in the lens of these laws. Uh, so I guess like why is the law of the sea important? Um, most of the Earth is covered in water. Uh, but even more important is that 64% of the Earth is what's called high seas. So basically, it's, it's, it's ocean that's not uh, a part of any nation's territory. Uh, and so there's no national law that governs it. Uh, and then lastly, almost all of like, global commerce goes through the water. Uh, so kind of the law of the sea started off uh, back in the 17th century. It was just understood that nations would have three nautical miles from their coast. A, a nautical mile is uh, just a little bit more than a normal mile. It's uh, one minute of latitude. And the, the reason for that is uh, simply because like ships wouldn't go out that far. They would hug the coast whenever they would um, travel around. But eventually nations, they started to want like more rights to their coastline and the resources that they could exploit there. Um, so uh, in 1973, we started looking to create this law of the sea. Um, and it, it was, uh, certain parts of it were quite controversial, so it took a long time to, to really hammer out. And then it didn't really go into force until 1994, so it's uh, quite recent in terms of international law. Uh, so, you know, it's well recognized by most countries, including the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, it's not recognized by the United States. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, a, you know, a fair amount of it is arrogance, right? But uh, really, the kind of the view of the United States at the time was we have this we have this huge navy we have this powerful navy why should we give all these other nations these rights that uh, we've basically fought for ourselves and then also um, also we kind of have uh, issues with uh, what I'll explain later as the exclusive economic zone uh, you know how how certain like resources are how mineral basically mineral rights how they work in terms of uh, exploiting fisheries and uh, oil and things like that. However, we do recognize it as international law. So we, even though we, we, we haven't ratified it, we do enforce it. And 
between the U U.S. and the United Kingdom, we're basically the biggest enforcers of it. And I'll, I'll talk about how we do that towards the end of the slide. Um, so just to kind of start out with how, to, how talking about the actual law itself, it starts with defining like when, where the sea starts, which is, which is your baseline. Um, and typically that's just a low tide mark on your shoreline. Uh, but there are some exceptions to that. Like for instance, like if you have a lot of barrier islands, like your baseline will start further out. And I'll show later as well that a lot of nations will try and cheat their baselines to get more territorial waters. Uh, and so that's one of the things the Navy does is in actually enforce baselines. Uh, and then now we get to kind of the meat of, uh, of the law of the sea, which is the maritime zones, uh, which are defined here. And I'll kind of go through each one and tell you what they actually mean. Uh, but you can see the internal waters are anything landward of your baseline. Territorial sea goes out 12 nautical miles. Your contiguous zone, basically your continental shelf, goes out 24 nautical miles. Your exclusive economic zone goes out 200 nautical miles. And then high seas is anything past the exclusive economic zone. Uh, so this is just kind of an artist rendering, i.e. me, of the, uh, the zones. And then also you'll see national airspace goes out 12 nautical miles. And international airspace is anything past that. Uh, and then outer space is defined anywhere from like 19 kilometers up to 99 kilometers up. And uh, some nations don't even recognize outer space. They claim sovereignty in perpetuity. Uh, but uh, those, like the, mostly those are like third world African nations. So they're not really relevant in terms of space yet. Uh, so internal waters was that, that first zone. Like I said, it was 12 nautical, or sorry, no, it's not. Uh, internal waters is that first zone, so anything landward of the baseline. And in order to like navigate in that regime, you need consent of the nation because it's uh, sovereign territory. Uh, next, there's territorial sea, which is again twelve nautical miles out. Uh, and again, this is this is sovereign territory of the nation. And uh, the way we sort of navigate in this regime is called innocent passage. So basically, what that means is you can't anchor there, you can't conduct any. Um, military operations there or anything like that, your transit through there has to be like continuous and expeditious. Uh, and a nation can suspend the right to, of uh, a nation to exercise innocent passage. So for instance, after 9-11, the US basically um, restricted any navigation within our territorial waters. Uh, we're skipping that. So next is the continu contiguous zone. Like I said, this is kind of your continental shelf. Um, so permission, no permissions needed here. This is international waters. Uh, and really this kind of is where a, a state gives a state a buffer zone to enforce like a lot of different, a, a lot of their laws. So for instance, like if a nation, or if, a, if a ship is coming in port, they can meet them out in the contiguous zone to enforce customs and things like that. Uh, however, the navigational regime is uh, what's called high seas freedom of navigation and overflight. Basically what that means is you can do whatever you want. Um, and and it's the, 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 nation's, the nation has no right to actually like enforce any of their laws in, in this area. Uh, and then also I guess something that's interesting is that um, like if you can prove that your continental shelf goes out further than 24 nautical miles, then you can get your contiguous zone extended uh, legally. So this is something that Canada is trying to do. Uh, in the Northern Passage. So they, you know, they really want to be able to control that area. So they're uh, trying really hard to like, provide evidence to the United Nations that they, their continental shelf extends further out. Uh, lastly uh, is the exclusive economic zone. So this gives, again, gives you like, things like rights over minerals and fisheries and uh, those sorts of things, rights to build artificial islands, um, conduct research, protect the environment, things like that. Um, and again, this is, like I said, this is the thing that the US really disagreed with. We didn't want to give uh, nations so, so much power to govern the resources uh, nearby to their coast. And again, the navigational regime is the same, uh, high seas freedom navigation over flight. So this is the summary uh, of sort of the regimes and then the zones, like I said. So uh, that was kind of boring. But uh, some, uh, eventually we'll get to some case studies of looking at this. So the next thing uh, is national airspace. So you have to ask permission to, to go into national airspace. And again, it's 12 nautical miles. Uh, 
Uh, and the exception is only in emergencies, like you're going to crash land or you need to make an emergency landing and things like that. International airspace, you have um, pretty much freedom to do whatever you want, so long as you, you, you basically do it safely, as you don't endanger other people. Uh, as you might imagine, um, 12 nautical miles in an airplane like isn't far at all. Like An airplane can do that in uh, maybe a minute or so, and then a military aircraft could do that in maybe like 30 seconds. So what the law of the sea also allows people to do is can, uh, create an air defense identification zone. Basically what that means is that uh, a, a nation can like uh, have, have a radar suite such that they identify aircraft outside of their sovereign airspace and then they can um, require them to identify themselves if they're entering the airspace. So this is like in movies, you know, you see them like scrambling the fighter jets and uh, then like escorting some plane that's like coming into airspace that way. Basically, you know, they can like shoot it down the second it enters uh, national airspace. All right, so now we'll kind of get to the case study of the South China Sea. So this is something that's been in the news a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of explain why. So that's the South China Sea, if anyone didn't know where it was. Um, on, the, on the left here is all the overlapping exclusive economic zones in the South China Sea. So you can see that it's very crowded. And then on the right is what's called the nine dashed line. The, um, the uh, People's Republic of China claims the entire South China Sea as their territorial waters based on historical claims. Uh, and they sort of define what it is based on this very vague like nine dash line. So it's very, very contentious. There's a lot of like players and um, it's very, it's a very valuable uh, region as well. So um, tons of trade goes through there. It's right next to the Straits of Malacca. Um, and obviously you have these highly populous, all these highly populous uh, Asian nations right there. Uh, and then there's a ton of like oil and natural gas there as well. So, and then again, here, these are like more of the claims of the natural gas block, oil and natural gas blocks claimed. So this is uh, basically, this is a, my point is this is like a really desirable reason. So it, it makes sense that lots of nations are trying to get their hands in there. Um, what the, what the Chinese have done is, they, is they've started building artificial islands uh, within the South China Sea to then get um, an exclusive economic zone that they can then use to exploit the natural resources in the, in the South China Sea. So um, here are two examples of uh, uh, things that were previously submerged that they've basically dredged out to, to put an installation on there. And um, more than that, they're, they're heavily militarizing these islands too. So like uh, they're putting like all sorts of weapon systems, missiles, um, fighter and bomber aircraft, uh, anti-ship missiles, anti-cruise, anti-ship cruise missiles and anti-ship ballistic missiles, as well as high power radar. And so these are kind of like the ranges of like all these weapon systems. So you can see that they basically have full co coverage over the entire sea. So if they wanted to, they could um, restrict access quite easily. Um, I guess the I guess the the problem with this is I'll have to go back to some more uh, legal stuff to explain like what the issue is here. Um, basically, in the law of the sea, the, an island is defined as an, a naturally formed area of land that can uh, maintain human life and habitation. Um, and then under the law of the sea, they get you know all the all the respective zones that we discussed. Uh, but a rock can't cannot maintain human habitation or economic life. Uh, and as a result, um, they only get a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. They don't get any of the other things. Uh, and then artificial islands um, basically don't get uh, anything really. They uh, only get a 500 meter safety zone and uh, they can only be built within the exclusive economic zone of a nation. So you can see that uh, these are the kind of the islands in question that China is building. So you can see that they're not anywhere near the exclusive economic zone of the uh, of China. Uh, so you know how do they how do they settle this issue? Uh, the South China or the Law of the Seas um, settled within the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, uh, and so it was settled in 2016, and 
basically, these are kind of all the plaintiffs in, in the case. Uh, and the key ruling was that China has no rights based on the nine dash line. So they um, pretty much completely, uh, completely uh, disregarded the, the Chinese claims of the nine dash line, which would have made the artificial islands legitimate if it was their territorial waters, right? Um, and it found that basically none of the features in question are legally islands. So they're all either rocks or they're submerged at high tide. Um, but it wouldn't rule on the actual sovereignty of the features. So it wouldn't say that like, yes, this island uh, belongs to the Chinese or the Philippines or whoever. So this is kind of just a summary of the ruling. Uh, basically, you can see that some of them get territorial seas because they're rocks. Some of them are just submerged completely and they don't get anything. Uh, but again, none of them are islands, which is the key ruling. So what? So like, how do we how do we actually respond to the court's ruling? The court doesn't really have any like ability to um, enforce its ruling. So that's left up to the international community, i.e., countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, the only enforcement is through international pressure. Um, so we do what's called freedom of navigation operations. Um, this is kind of some raw raw talk from the U.S. Pacific commander, basically. Uh, he's saying that uh, we should do, um, we'll, the United States will continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows and support the right of all nations to do the same. And so the way we do that uh, is honestly kind of petty. Uh, you can see, uh, so these are like two, the two reefs that I showed before. Um, so basically what we do is we just sail warships within 12 nautical miles of their island. Uh, and the, the, the key, the key, like, I guess like the key piece of that though, is like, we don't do it in that in innocent passage regime that I talked about. We do it, um, like conducting military operations. Like we have our radars on, like we have our very high powered radars on, like we're doing, uh, all sorts of drills and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I guess also the. I guess the, the another key piece of this is like we're not we don't just do this to China like um, we we kind of we do this to a lot of people I, I mentioned that I mentioned before that like lots of nations uh, try and cheat their baseline so like here's an example of that where uh, Vietnam tries to say that all of these islands on their like external coast are barrier islands and therefore like all of that all of this is internal waters which is which is um, a, a bit absurd because that's like 100 nautical miles of, terito or of territorial waters. Uh, so this is what we say like they actually have. Um, these are all the nations that claim that the U.S. says claim excessive baselines. Uh, and furthermore, the, uh, these are all the nations that we conducted um, freedom of navigation operations against. I don't know. It looks kind of hard to read. But basically, there, there's a number of nations on here that are actually, you know, they're pretty strong U.S. allies. Japan's on there, Taiwan's on there. Um, so I guess we're, we're, we don't really discriminate in terms of enforcing the law of the sea is uh, kind of the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, so that was the, I guess that was the law of the sea piece. Now we'll move on to the space piece. So space has uh, been in the news a lot too. Uh, mostly because of uh, President Trump wanting to wanting to create a U.S. space force, uh, but also like there's lots of um, development of space weapons, which I'll which I'll get to. So, kind of the historical context of space uh, in, within like military use was uh, celestial navigation. So um, that's how ships would navigate back in the day of sail. And it's actually still used today. Like I got taught how, like I know how to use a sextant and I got taught that in, in school um, because we use it to check our instruments and things like that on ships. Uh, but it really heated up with uh, the Cold War. Um, so here's some of like the pretty ridiculous stuff that I kind of found uh, doing research for this. Operation Paperclip is basically, we, we like gave immunity to all the Nazi scientists and brought them to the U.S. to build rockets and other weapons for us. Um, Project Thor was like the rods from God, so we would uh, we had plans to put um, 
tungsten rods in in orbit and then use them to like use them for kinetic bombardment of like different targets um, the really ridiculous one that i, I is uh we were actually going to launch a nuclear weapon at the moon uh pretty much just to prove that we could like just to uh just yeah so and then um the strategic defense initiative is uh like a pretty famous one as well uh where we which was really kind of the first missile defense um uh, initiative. Uh, so you can see like things were getting out of hand like pretty fast and we we needed again we needed some guiding principles to to really rein in the space race in a lot of ways. Uh, so, so I guess like the first real space treaty in a sense was the 1963 partial nuclear test ban. Uh, basically what that did was that banned testing like underwater and in space and things like that. Uh, the next one was the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, which uh, was in 1966, uh, and again, this is kind of this is kind of like the major piece of, of space legislation that still exists today. Uh, what it actually says is that um, it guarantees basically freedom of space, freedom to use space, freedom to explore within space, and then it also prohibits claims of national sovereignty in space. So, like an interesting uh, point with this is that when the U.S. planted a flag on the moon. We also had to pass an act of Congress saying that us planting a flag on the moon wasn't us claiming the moon as sovereign U.S. territory, uh, because that you know obviously planting a flag is typically like a, an action that is associated with that. Uh, it bans uh, placement of nuclear weapons like in orbit and on celestial bodies, but it actually doesn't. It doesn't actually ban like military other military activities in space and stuff like that. Uh, the second piece of, of legislation is the 2006 UN Space Preservation Treaty. This basically does ban weapons in space. It puts a moratorium on uh, weapons in space. And uh, I guess for the second time in this presentation, the US uh, doesn't recognize it. And um, the reason for this one, in, in my opinion, is a bit more legitimate because uh, th this uh, treaty was like bas basically written and submitted by China and Russia. and the the reason maybe wasn't such a, such a peaceful reason. It was perhaps more, in my opinion, uh, to prevent the U.S. from continuing to develop its capabilities, uh, so that China and Russia could catch up. And uh, you'll see that in the following slides, like there's little respect shown for this treaty. Like basically, everyone is still developing space weapons, even though. Every like literally every country in the UN except for the U.S. and Israel said they would. Um, so yeah, just here's some some space weapons that are like modern that are kind of making the news. Uh, so this is a this first one is a Russian satellite that um, can maneuver and latch on to other satellites. Uh, this is this is all like very secretive and um, alleged, I guess. But uh, we've, we've seen evidence of them doing this, uh, latching on to other satellites and also maneuvering to like crash in to other satellites if, if necessary. Um, the US has conducted uh, anti-satellite missile tests. So we've shot satellites out of the sky with missiles. Uh, and then the Chinese also have uh, demonstrated ability to shoot satellites out of the sky with missiles. Uh, and then if you didn't know, the US Air Force actually has basically like a, its own space shuttle. Uh, that it uses to conduct missions, uh, though it, it's unmanned. Uh, and then there's plenty of other stuff, like there's obviously intercontinental ballistic missiles that go into space, uh, and then you know lasers, uh, hypersonic weapons that are heavily in development now, and stuff like that. Uh, and then there's also like space assets that aren't necessarily um, aren't necessarily weapons, but are used to conduct warfare. So GPS, targeting, communication satellites. Um, stuff like that, uh, that, you know, that, you know, this is questionable, like, is it a weapon? Is it not? Uh, and how, sh how should we deal with that? So obviously war in space would be really catastrophic. Um, <laughs> and the reason for that is, is because of space debris. So, uh, obviously. Uh, if you have lots of debris in space, it's going to crash into things. And so one of the things that uh, everyone's worried about is this thing called the Kessler limit. Basically, uh, this guy named Kessler like cal uh, calculated uh, th that there's a certain limit where 
Um, the collisions are such that they'll just cast cascade and nothing else can exist in space. So like, uh, obviously like the, you know, things just become unstable. Um, and uh, I don't know, did I explain that well? Uh, the castle limit? Yeah, so, um, so th there's a real need to like protect space assets and the, the commerce they enable. Like, you know, something like GPS underpins like every piece of technology that exists now. Um, and so, so there's really a need to, to like uh, not have war in space, essentially. Um, so someone that has a lot to say on this is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I, I think probably most of the Americans are familiar with him, um, at least. But he's an American astrophysicist, and he actually has some legitimacy. He's on the um, National Space Council, and he works for the Defense Innovation Board. Um, and he kind of has this view that... Uh, Peaceful use of space isn't realistic. You know, if you could sign a treaty and go into space and not kill each other, why weren't you doing that on Earth? Uh, and so, you know, we still take human nature wherever we go. Like, it's easy in 1966 to sign the Outer Space Treaty and ban all these things that we didn't have the technology to do yet. But now we do have the technology to do a lot of them. And so these, these treaties are really going to be put to the test in, in, the, in, kind of in the coming future, I suppose. Uh, but the, I did want to finish uh, on, on a hopeful note. Uh, he also has two other thoughts that um, uh, I guess are a little bit more hopeful. And uh, the first is that like space debris will render war impossible. So nations will be very hesitant to go to war in space simply because they'll be also be putting their own space assets uh, in jeopardy, uh, you know, particularly if we reach the Kessler limit. Uh, and then also, the, um, typically wars are fought over resources and um, the scarcity of resources, but outer space promises unlimited resources. Uh, so perhaps uh, this is maybe a little bit more of a philosophical argument, but perhaps um, you know, our, our ability to explore and go into outer space will um, see the end of current warfare as we know it now. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the engineering is still like really hard, so yeah, the engineering is really hard. So like I don't like really none of the, you know this stuff is certainly I'm giving a presentation on it, so obviously it's current and it's modern, but we're not that close yet. I don't think we're not we're not that close to like going to war in space. So uh, I think that's pretty much all I got. Uh, just stuff from some more hype pictures. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm also happy to like they don't have to just be about like law of the sea and space, like I'm happy to answer about like the military and stuff like that as well. So yeah.